Hello to everyone. Wishing all of you a happy Independence Day. And we are fortunate to have uh, Professor Yashwan Gupta today with us to tell the story of radio astronomy from JC modern times. And to have uh, Professor Yashwan Gupta today with us to tell the story of from JC modern times. And to have uh, Professor Yashwan Gupta today with us to tell the story of from JC modern times. And to have there looks like multiple yeah, echo yeah yeah i don't know it's, it's looping here yeah there yeah. looks like multiple echo i don't know how to yeah yeah i don't know how does it stop it's looping here yeah there looks like how does it stop Yeah, so uh, we welcome you all to hear the story of radio astronomy from J.C. Bose to modern times by Professor Yashwan Gupta. And uh, I request Priya to introduce today's speaker. Yeah, so hello everyone and welcome to Astronomy Adda. Today we have Professor Yashwan Gupta with us who will talk about the story of radio astronomy. Uh, Professor Yashwan Gupta did his electrical engineering from IIT Kanpur, after which he went to UC San Diego to do his MSc and PhD. And then he joined the GMRT. And at present, he's the director of the GMRT. He's been a very um, active astronomer. He's even received the Shanti Swarup Bhattakar Award, amongst many other awards and accolades. He leads the Indian Initiative with the SKA. And it's really a pleasure to have him with us today. So welcome you, Professor Yashwan Gupta, and we'll start off with our talk today. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, can you all hear me? Um, Priya, can you just confirm if you can hear me? Uh, we can hear you, Yashwan. OK, great. OK. Thank you. Um, um, so a very uh, good afternoon to everybody. And it is a real pleasure to uh, give this webinar to all those who are connected. I don't know how many are. I can't make out. But uh, uh, we will be talking about the story of radio astronomy. And my aim is to give you all a basic introduction to radio astronomy. Uh, as to what we do and how we learn about the universe using radio waves um, so that uh, you can understand the basics and uh, find that interesting and exciting enough to be able to follow up 
uh, with more details um, uh, in the future. Uh, so we will start uh, right from the beginning. Uh, we all know that astronomy is perhaps the oldest science and it started from the time mankind turns its gaze upwards to try and understand the heavens. And of course, it started initially with the use of our naked eyes, because that is where the natural detectors for light waves uh, are present. And uh, all the signal processing was, of course, done in the human brain. There was, you know, there was no other tools or techniques. Uh, but all this changed dramatically, uh, as we know, with the invention of the telescope. And it was this gentleman, Galileo Galilei, who took the newly invented instrument and turned it uh, towards the heavens uh, to see what it would tell us. And that, as we know, revolutionized astronomy forever. Uh, and it's interesting to just see how that happened, uh, because that will lead us naturally to what happens beyond optical wavelengths. So if you look at the story of optical telescopes through the ages, starting with a replica of Galileo's uh, uh, small little telescope back in uh, in the 1600s to uh, the kind uh, replica of what Newton used uh, in his times from there to what uh, William Herschel used. Um, and you can see from there to some of the bigger telescopes ending up with uh, some of the largest optical telescopes which are now uh, either just getting operational or are being proposed to be built. And what you can see, uh, which is obvious in this, is that they are bigger with time. And so obviously bigger is better. And it's interesting to ask ourselves why bigger is better. And uh, when we look at this in more detail, uh, it is two factors uh, that come out, uh, which is one, of course, a bigger telescope collects more light. Hence, it can see fainter sources. Uh, and it is you know, just an analogy that whenever you want to collect, uh, if you have a bigger aperture, it will collect more light. And this is what we refer to formally as sensitivity, uh, which means that you can see more fainter objects in the universe if you have a bigger telescope that collects more light. The other factor which is important uh, uh, to keep in mind is that bigger telescopes provide higher magnification, which means that you can distinguish between nearby objects uh, or sources in the sky. Uh, technically, we call this uh, resolution. And uh, so if you have a bigger aperture, you have a higher or better resolution. Uh, and as you can uh, uh, imagine, the sensitivity since it depends on scope. The resolution, on the other hand, goes inversely as the size of the telescope. And it also depends on the wavelength of the observation. So it's roughly given by the wavelength divided by the size of the aperture, which means that if you have a given aperture size, if you go to smaller wavelengths, you will get a better resolution. Uh, and so these are things to keep in mind as we move forward. And uh, I will just illustrate these with a couple of examples. The simplest example is of the moon. If you look at the moon with your naked eyes, you would see something like this, just a bright disk with a little bit of patchy structure inside it. But the moment you turn the simplest telescopes towards the moon, uh, you can start seeing more and more detailed structure. And you can start making out uh, fainter objects, as well as more details of the objects that are present. So. Uh, uh, sensitivity means you can start seeing more fainter objects. The resolution means you can now start seeing more detail and objects which are earlier very close to each other or not separable now separate out into individual objects. We'll illustrate that with one more example. Uh, I think uh, most of you uh, would have heard about the Andromeda galaxy. It is one of our nearby galaxies to the Milky Way. It lies in the constellation of Andromeda uh, as shown here. And if you ask, can you see this galaxy? And if you go to places where the night sky is very clear, then in fact, with your naked eye, you can just about make out a small fuzzy patch. Uh, but the moment you put uh, small telescopes or bigger telescopes to point towards the Milky Way, 
you can start seeing both more details of the galaxy. Uh, so what looked like a fuzzy patch now begins to show a structure. And you can see a lot of the fainter objects. For example, you can start seeing the fainter stars, which are in the foreground of the galaxy. Uh, and as you uh, increase the aperture and use bigger telescopes, you can start making out fainter structures within the galaxy itself. So uh, we can now ask the question that what lies beyond the optical wave? Noted that astronomy started with the optical wavelengths because uh, we were able to have uh, the way of detecting the signals. But we know that light is part of the much wider range of the electromagnetic spectrum, which goes from the lowest frequency or largest wavelength radio waves to the highest frequency of the smallest wavelength gamma rays. And uh, this is one depiction of the electromagnetic spectrum showing low, fre low frequency, large wavelength radio waves at one end, going all the way through infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray to gamma rays as the highest frequency, shortest wavelength uh, radiation. And uh, so one question to ask is that can the same object in the universe emit or be studied at different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum? And we'll see in a moment that yes, this is indeed possible and do different Wavelengths give us different information about the object. And that also we'll see in a moment that yes, uh, that indeed actually does happen. And the third one is that are there objects or phenomena that can be studied only at some particular wavelengths? And actually that also happens to be true. And that is what then uh, makes it very interesting and exciting to ask this question, that is it possible then to have ways, the, the methodology uh, to study uh, radiation over there uh, as wide a range of the electromagnetic spectrum as possible from different objects in the universe. And again, uh, I will illustrate this with uh, going back to our Milky Way, sorry, the, the Andromeda galaxy. And this was the picture, I have a light picture of the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, but if you look at it in other wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, ranging from radio to infrared, to ultraviolet, to X-rays here, you can see very clearly that the object A looks different in the different wavelengths. Um, different parts of the galaxy uh, become more prominent or are seen more clearly at different wavelengths. And in fact, uh, certain different phenomena uh, are more easily seen at certain wavelengths uh, than others. And so this is then uh, the motivation to ask that, uh, can we do this? And uh, so indeed, uh, doing this is not straightforward. Uh, there are certain hurdles uh, to overcome. And to understand that, uh, let us look at uh, the two issues. One is that, you know, uh, we had natural detectors for optical uh, wavelengths in our eyes, but we need to have now the equivalent uh, uh, detectors for the other wavelengths. And this has happened with time with the development of technology, including improved ability to detect optical uh, radiation itself uh, with better uh, techniques. And uh, we'll see how that happened for uh, the radio waves. Uh, the second is, of course, this question that uh, do we actually get all these wavelengths uh, coming and reaching us? And uh, uh, to understand this, you, you all know about the ozone layer that protects us from harmful ultraviolet rays from the sun. And so uh, to understand this, one has to look at uh, this uh, overall picture, which shows the opacity of the Earth's environment, which means the Earth's atmosphere as well as the ionosphere, two different frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, uh, this time again going the opposite uh, direction from gamma rays to radio waves. Uh, and an opacity of 100% means that uh, the radiation is completely blocked. It does not reach us at the surface of the Earth. And opacity of zero obviously then means that the radiation can reach us. And as you can see from this, that there are two parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, namely the optical window here, 
where the opacity is such that you can actually uh, have the radiation reaching us and the large part of the radio window where the radio waves from outside can actually reach us at all other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum for one reason or the other uh, the electromagnetic radiation cannot reach us either the ionosphere blocks it at very low radio frequencies or uh, different uh, atomic and molecular species in the atmosphere uh, absorb that radiation and do not let it reach us so this then says that uh, after optical uh, if you were to expect uh, the next branch of astronomy to, to develop uh, should be in radio astronomy because that is the radiation that can actually reach us. And so if you have the right kind of detectors, then uh, you uh, ought to be able to uh, see this. Uh, but that is has its own story, uh, which dates back to when the concept of radio waves was first understood. And as we all know, it was uh, uh, Maxwell who developed the theory and predicted electromagnetic radiation could exist at all wavelengths, including radio. Uh, but it took a uh, uh, few more years uh, before people could actually demonstrate that radio waves uh, do exist. And uh, Hertz was one of the first ones to do it. But uh, having done it, he declared that they are of no practical use. And it was left at that. And then it took uh, Sir J.C. Bose and uh, very rapidly followed by Marconi to actually uh, build physical apparatus that would generate uh, waves and receive them and then show that you could actually have such radio waves generated and transmitted and received. And uh, so this is now 1890s. Uh, when uh, J.C. Bose did it uh, first uh, at a frequency of 60 gigahertz. Uh, but he, again, did it as a, as a scientific experiment to demonstrate um, it was actually Marconi who realized uh, the practical importance of radio waves. And uh, then... Um, uh, put them to use, including patenting some of the equipment uh, that he uh, developed. Uh, so uh, it, just take a moment here to recognize the brilliance of J.C. Bose, uh, who uh, really made this pioneering experiment uh, in Kolkata, uh, where this is a illustration of the apparatus that he used. And there are replicas of this, uh, which are uh, available as demonstration pieces. We have one at the GMRT, uh, as, uh, which we keep there as a, as a demonstration of the setup that uh, he used for generating radio waves. Now, from there, uh, the, there were still a few more steps uh, before uh, radio astronomy took birth, uh, because uh, you need to uh, actually have uh, good quality detectors that could detect uh, the faint radio signals coming from outside. And this only happened when this radio technology first demonstrated by J.C. Bose and then uh, put to practical use by Marconi uh, began to grow uh, and uh, people started building long distance radio communication systems uh, using this technology to, you know, to communicate uh, as for example, uh, across the Atlantic from, from the US to the Europe. And this is where uh, the story takes us next. And um, as often happens uh, in many uh, aspects of astronomy, this was also a serendipitous discovery uh, where um, what happened was that in Bell Labs, um, the equipment that was being built to do transatlantic communication was giving some problems. It was producing unwanted interference or, uh, or unwanted hiss that was uh, corrupting the performance of the system. And the uh, engineers there uh, tasked it to Carl Jansky uh, to try and find out as to what was the cause of the problem. 
uh, where was this unwanted signal coming from? Was it within the equipment? Was it something nearby that was transmitting? And so in order to debug and understand this problem, Carl Jansky built what was really the first radio telescope, uh, so to speak, uh, and though it looks very different from what we think of when we think of a radio telescope, uh, but it was the set of antennas mounted on a rotating platform, uh, which then formed a beam in a given direction. And by rotating the platform, he could point this beam in different directions and try to find out where this unwanted signal was coming from. And when he carried this out, he found to his surprise that this there was an unwanted signal which was producing this hiss or distortion, but it was not coming from any fixed spot on the earth, but appeared to be coming from some fixed direction in the sky. And that is how it was then realized that we were picking up radio signals from a celestial object in the sky rather than from any other terrestrial source. And so this was then the first radio astronomy detection uh, which was made by Karl Jansky, and it started off the whole field. And uh, uh, But still, for many years, it was more a hobby kind of a, a, um, a work because the optical astronomers still did not think that, that there would be anything very significant that radio astronomy would show. Uh, but uh, the next person who took a big step was Grote Reber, who was also an engineer working in Bell Labs. And during his spare time in his own backyard, he assembled this uh, instrument, which now looks a bit more like what we imagine when we think of a radio telescope. Uh, and um, he built this uh, as a fairly sophisticated instrument for its times in 1940. And then he used it to do a reasonably systematic uh, study of the sky and to map it out uh, and make a map of the strength of the radio emission that could be seen. And so this was then the first radio map of the sky made by Grote Reber. And what this is, it's a contour plot. And like in any contour plot, uh, the uh, different contour levels show the different, um, uh, in this case, the different levels of the intensity of the radio waves coming from a given direction. And what it then shows is that uh, the bulk of the radio waves that it detected were lying in this particular strip along the sky. And uh, it was no surprise then to find that this is the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. So this corresponded with the actual uh, plane of the Milky Way galaxy. And within this, there are regions which are brighter and so, for example, this thing which is labeled as Sagittarius is uh, the direction towards the center of our galaxy. And this is actually the source that Karl Jansky saw in his first experiment. And there are other bright sources labeled like Cygnus, Cassiopeia, which are discrete sources, some uh, later found to be uh, either within our galaxy or some found to be extragalactic um, sources such as other galaxies and so on. And so from there, the field then evolved rapidly uh, because it became very clear uh, and quite quickly that uh, we were seeing a complementary view to the optical sky. Uh, and so you remember, we discussed this in the beginning that can uh, you see different phenomena or different objects uh, with the different wavelengths. And pretty soon, uh, people realized that the brightest radio sources often did not have any significant optical counterparts and vice versa. And so what this meant is that one was actually now probing different kinds of physical phenomena, uh, which were more uh, prone to give radio waves rather than optical waves. And uh, therefore, there was great value to build uh, radio astronomy uh, and do more sensitive and uh, better quality observations. And I'll just illustrate this. Uh, fact with a simple example. So this is a reconstructed view in optical wavelengths of what our galaxy would look like uh, when seen from afar. And so as we all know, the galaxy is a thin disk. And so we are looking edge on at the disk and you can see most of the optical radiation is confined pretty much to the uh, 
plane of the disk uh, with a bulge at the center. And that is because most of this emission comes from stars and uh, nebulae, which mostly lie along the, uh, the uh, confined to the disk of the galaxy. But when you re make a similarly reconstructed image of the galaxy as seen in radio, then it looks like the bottom right, where now you can see a remarkable difference that although a good amount of the radiation is still coming from the disk of the galaxy, but it has uh, got a different distribution even there. But importantly, a lot of it is also coming from far away from the disk of the galaxy, saying that there are other phenomena, uh, other objects which are present there, which are emitting significant amount of radiation, uh, which are when, uh, you know, when seen uh, appear to be at much higher galactic latitudes away from the plane of the galaxy. So this then uh, just reinforces what we talked about earlier, that different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum can give you complementary views of the universe. And that the reason, as I said, is that the physical processes giving rise to radio emission are very different from that of optical. And hence, sources look very different in the radio and the optical. And so we get a new window to uh, observing the universe. Um, I don't have enough time in this talk to uh, go a little bit more into the details of what these different processes are, uh, but that is probably best left for a more detailed follow-up uh, presentation on uh, radio astronomy. Uh, but what we would like to look at a little bit more is from the time of uh, uh, Jansky and Reber, how have the tools of radio astronomy evolved? just like we saw the evolution of the optical telescopes um, in the very beginning. And so uh, in order to understand this, uh, what we need to understand is what are the basics of a radio telescope. So in some sense, a basic radio telescope is not very different from your satellite dish receiver uh, with which you receive all your interesting um, uh, channels from uh, of, of, uh, on the television uh, uh, which are then beamed from uh, a satellite that is relaying the signals. Uh, there is just one major difference, uh, which makes a big difference when we look at the details, is that these celestial radio signals are very, very weak compared to the man-made signals that we deal with. Uh, and the, the way to look at that is the typical unit that we use uh, for describing the strength of a radio signal is called the Jansky in honor of Karl Jansky. And one Jansky is a number like this, 10 to the minus 26 watts per square meter uh, per unit frequency of power. And that, as you can see, is a, is a very small number. Uh, and uh, if you are more familiar with, the, for example, electrical engineering terminology, then this power, when received by a typical telescope, uh, which is of the order of a few meters or tens of meters in size is minus 100 dBm of power. And just to remember that zero dBm is one millijoule. Uh, uh, sorry, zero dBm is one uh, milliwatt of, uh, of power. And so it would take thousand years of continuous operation of a telescope of that size to collect one millijoule of energy. So. All of this then uh, drives to the following, that in order to get that sensitivity that we talked about, the high sensitivity, that is to be able to see fainter sources out to distant reaches of the universe, you need to collect much more of the radio signal. Uh, and that means that you have to either increase the per meter square uh, of the uh, area that is collecting this signal, and therefore, very large dishes, several tens of meters in diameter, or even bigger, uh, in order to get enough signal. Second, as I, uh, I sort of skipped over it, but whenever you pick up this uh, signal uh, and amplify it and then bring it uh, to a receiver where you can uh, finally detect it, uh, which is now the equivalent of the detection circuit uh, that we were earlier talking about, then there is always noise that is generated uh, by the electronics. Uh, that is just inherent in any electronics that there is a certain amount of inbuilt noise. And so if your signal is much weaker than the noise, then it, 
you will have difficulty in detecting it. And so in order to, again to see weaker and fainter sources, uh, you need to then build electronics which has as minimal noise as possible. And again, there are technologies or techniques uh, that uh, allow you uh, to do this, uh, but uh, we don't have time to go into the details of that. In some cases, uh, in the extreme case, you have to uh, cool uh, the electronics uh, to very low temperatures in cryogenic receivers, uh, which is where the noise from the uh, devices comes down to uh, much lower levels, which makes uh, the telescope more sensitive. Uh, the third thing, of course, that you can do in order to collect more signal is to increase the number of hertz, that is the band width over which you're collecting the signal. And that often is um, um, uh, works well because many of the natural sources uh, that we're dealing with often are emitting over a wide range of frequency. And, uh, and therefore, if you can increase the bandwidth of the observation and observe over a larger bandwidth, then you can uh, pick up more of the, of the signal from the source. That, of course, again, requires uh, certain kinds of technology because everything in the telescope all the way from the point where the waves are reflected and picked up uh, and converted to electrical voltage here and then taken down and amplified. All of that has to be able to handle the wider range of frequencies. Uh, finally, the other thing that we do in order to uh, increase the sensitivity is to observe the source for very long periods. And the reason for that is that even when you have a certain amount of noise that comes along uh, with uh, the signal, uh, it, it can be shown that the noise being a random process, uh, if you integrate the final um, signal or the intensity that uh, is coming out from the receiver, uh, then the signal grows linearly uh, as you integrate more, uh, but the noise grows only as the square root of the time that you integrate. And therefore, signal to noise can be shown to increase with the duration of the observation. So if you increase either the bandwidth of the observation, as provided the source does emit over the larger range of frequencies, um, um, and if you increase the duration of the observation, then you can improve the signal to noise given uh, an antenna of a given size and electronics with a certain amount of noise that is present. So these are the different ways in which one tries to improve the sensitivity so that one can see fainter sources in the universe. But remember, there was two things that one uh, was uh, wanting uh, in order to uh, have a detailed study of the universe. One was the sensitivity, other was the resolution. Now, when we come back to the resolution, uh, again, uh, just uh, to, to remind, as we said, that the resolution of any telescope uh, depends on the wavelength divided by the size of the aperture, lambda by d. And now, because we are operating at wavelengths which are much, much larger than the optical uh, wavelengths, uh, uh, this factor really hits us. Uh, so even if you have a diameter of a 100 meter size telescope, which is a huge telescope, so this is a 100 meter size antenna, uh, fully steerable, it can move in different directions and point at different objects in the sky. Even with this, if you're observing at, um, uh, say, a one meter wavelength, which is 300 megahertz, the resolution is only half a degree. Uh, half a degree is 30 arc minutes is the angular size of the moon. Uh, which means that if you go back to the uh, uh, description that we had earlier, that if you pointed this 100 meter size antenna to the moon uh, and the moon was emitting radio waves, then you would just see this blurred shape of the moon. You would not be able to make out any of these details that the simple, small uh, centimeter size optical telescope can pick up. And so now you can see uh, so this is the equivalent story if you were to look at uh, the Andromeda galaxy uh, with this kind of telescope. Instead of that nice image that I showed you earlier, you would just see this blurred image of the galaxy because you just don't have the resolution to be able to resolve the finer structure. So this was a big problem. Uh, 
uh, because uh, at this point you can see that uh, radio astronomy can't quite give you the complementary information to optical because optical can easily show you the structure and uh, shape of the galaxy but uh, radio astronomy cannot uh, give you the matching information uh, you can build bigger than 100 meters it's difficult it's expensive to build huge uh, single dishes which are fully steerable so there are bigger antennas uh, which but they are fixed so here's a 300 meter size antenna but it is fixed, it can't rotate, it's just too heavy. And uh, it just can observe objects as they pass through the transit uh, with a little bit of flexibility by moving the focus uh, a little bit around, uh, but not much. So uh, this uh, was, a, uh, was realized by the sort of 60s, 1960s as a, a major stumbling block for radio astronomy. Uh, but then uh, there was a clever solution and that came about uh, clever enough that it was actually uh, worthy of a Nobel Prize. So this was the concept of uh, Earth rotation aperture synthesis. So what it says is that in order to synthesize telescope of a larger size, as far as resolution is concerned, then you can do that by building many smaller telescopes uh, and spreading them out over larger distances and collecting the signals from them and combining them in an appropriate fashion uh, to achieve the resolution, uh, which is equivalent to that of a single telescope whose dimension or size would have been the largest separation between the individual antennas in the array, rather than the size of an uh, individual antenna. So here the D in the denominator, uh, where, which was earlier the size of this dish, is now replaced by DS, which is the largest separation of the antennas in the array. Now you can see that that's a bit more uh, tractable because you can make these antennas relatively small. As long as you have enough land that you can spread them out, uh, then you can go out to kilometers uh, kind of separation. And then you are now building an antenna whose resolution is equal to that of a kilometer size telescope rather than 100 meter size uh, telescope. So it was Sir Martin Ryle who first pioneered this idea. And uh, I'll just explain that a little bit more technically, though, uh, again, there's not enough time to get into the details of this. Uh, so uh, it, of course, requires a particular way in which you combine the signals from all the N antennas in your array. Uh, and you have to do that pairwise for every antenna. And that is because uh, it can be shown that a pair of such antennas uh, receiving signals from a celestial source. Uh, actually, it is uh, very analogous to your Young's double slit, which many uh, people would have studied um, uh, as part of the basic understanding of uh, uh, in, in physics, uh, which then says that the signal that it sees is basically multiplying the sky brightness distribution by a sinusoidal response pattern of this pair of antennas. And whenever you're sensitive to one sinusoidal response uh, in the image, you are picking up one Fourier component of the image. So now this is, so this, uh, is a different way of thinking about it. So if you think of the intensity distribution in the sky and decompose it into a spatial Fourier transform, which would actually perforce to be a 2D Fourier transform because you're looking at a two-dimensional image, then uh, a given antenna pair uh, responds to one Fourier component of the image. And uh, in order to pick up the strength of that component, you have to do this uh, slightly complicated processing of the signals uh, coming from the two antennas. Uh, you have to correlate them and get their cross spectrum. I won't go into the details of that, uh, but uh, once one appreciates that then by using all pairwise combinations of the antennas present in the array, you can measure uh, several different Fourier components of the image. And then finally, when you have measured enough of those components, you can inverse Fourier transform and get back the image and uh, thereby synthesizing the larger aperture. Uh, and that actually took a while in, uh, for radio astronomers to develop and refine this technique, but it is now well understood. There are caveats about how you do this, um, but I will not go into the details of that over here, uh, save to show 
uh, the effect of or the example of what happens when you do this right. So this is an example of a radio galaxy, um, Cygnus A, um, made with one of the single, large single dish telescopes before the advent of this uh, uh, array technology. And this is an image of the same radio galaxy made with uh, this uh, the VLA, this the instrument that I showed in this slide, which was which was built in the 80s, 1980s, and uh, as one of the pioneering uh, radio telescope arrays. And what you can see here is uh, a clear difference in the resolution or the quality of the image. Um, so although this is this is an this is a contoured image and this is actually a grayscale image, but nevertheless. You can make out that uh, it can uh, it can see that this central blob of emission is much compact than what this image shows. Uh, there is extra uh, sensitivity in the structure of the emission coming from the lobes of the radio galaxy, which is just very coarsely seen in this image. So this then allowed radio astronomy to grow and uh, be competitive in terms of being able to compare the uh, images got from radio astronomy with say optical wavelengths and uh, and be able to have um, significant resolution and we'll come back to that shortly uh, there is of course uh, another uh, way in which the signals from the individual antennas in an array can be combined uh, different from that complicated uh, pairwise um, correlation arrangement that i showed uh, just now and that is important for certain situations because finally as we know that uh, there, there's a limit to the resolution of the array also uh, which is the uh, where the ds is the largest separation of the array and if you have very compact uh, radio sources uh, in the sky which really can't be resolved by this um, resolution then it doesn't make uh, really it's not very useful to do all of that uh, complicated processing of the signals uh, you can simply add the signals from all the antennas just to make it uh, a more sensitive instrument uh, but uh, having the resolution which may not match the resolution of the array and this is often useful uh, because you can compensate for the cost of the extra uh, com um, signal processing and computation that is required in the array telescope to be able to collect the signal with a much higher say time resolution or frequency resolution and this is very useful for looking at very compact objects such as neutron stars or pulsars uh, where you don't really need that resolution again i won't go into the details of this but this is what is called an array mode or a beamformer mode of a radio telescope it requires you to calibrate the signals from different antennas properly correct for the time delays between the different antennas but all that is possible and you can get a um, uh, an improved single dish uh, telescope by doing this. So you can ask, well, um, how far can you take this concept? We talked about antennas separated by uh, tens of kilometers, uh, but you can imagine that if you had the technology, you can do this for antennas separated on hundreds and thousands of kilometers uh, across the entire continent, for example. And indeed, this is done. It is called very long baseline interferometry. So baseline is the terminology used for this largest separation between the antennas. And so here uh, you have antennas spread out uh, over the entire country, uh, if not the continent. And you are uh, doing the same thing, that is taking the signals from the individual antennas, which are all observing the same source, and combining them appropriately. And you may ask, well, how do you combine the signals? Uh, you have to record them locally and then transport them to a common place where that pairwise correlation has to be done. Uh, today, it is possible with uh, optical fibers connecting uh, every place on the earth to every other place to transmit the signals in real time over optical fiber to a common place where they are then collected and uh, the signal processing is carried out. And that is now called uh, EVLBI for electronic VLBI where you can actually uh, do this in uh, real time effectively just like you do in a uh, small radio telescope and sure enough you can then with the jump of imagination uh, say well you can do it across continents and that is also done uh, in fact there are large VLBI networks now uh, over the globe 
uh, which tried to do this and all of you who followed the uh, the, e, the 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 detection of the radio detection of the shadow of the black hole the eht was one such experiment with antennas located in different continents uh, working at uh, the radio uh, millimeter wave uh, radio frequencies uh, to image uh, the core of the galaxy and um, you can take one more leap of faith and you say well can you do this which is to correlate signals from antennas on the earth to antennas which are uh, in space um, uh, orbiting around the earth sent up uh, as payloads uh, on space probes and indeed uh, that has been done it is possible there was one pro project called radiastron which ran over the last uh, almost decade or so it just wound up uh, last year or so where this antenna was um, flown out into space and then uh, you know unfurled and made to work like a radio antenna and uh, um, in fact part of the receiver here was one of the receiver systems was partly built in india uh, and supplied uh, this was a russian led project and the signals were correlated between the uh, antenna so this this radio signal collected from the celestial source was beamed uh, back from the satellite to the earth receiving station and then that was taken and correlated with the other antennas and now that allows you resolution which is equivalent to an antenna whose size is now tens of uh, several tens of thousands uh, of kilometers and that then allows you to uh, for example here look peer right into the uh, the innards of the core of a galaxy to see if there is uh, material shooting out from the core like i showed in that uh, radio image of uh, signal say then uh, what does it look like is it a smooth stream of particles or is it knots of such naughty stuff moving out and, and so on so you can start studying uh, the galaxies and other objects in very high detail so uh, finally uh, before we uh, uh, turn away there is uh, to something else uh, which is the local history of radio astronomy is the thing that i think most of us know that radio astronomy provides uh, perhaps uh, the best uh, tool for actually detecting uh, signals from extraterrestrial intelligence uh, which has uh, got a formal name seti the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and um, there are both um, normal radio telescopes which are used for radio astronomy which spend some of their time looking for radio signals from aliens as well as specially built radio telescopes which are primarily funded uh, in order to carry out detailed SETI studies and um, uh, yes uh, we so far no such clear signal has been detected but uh, there is a fair amount of uh, time spent by uh, radio astronomy facilities and uh, searching for such signals and so what with that we'll just turn to uh, what has been the growth of radio astronomy in our own country and uh, take it up with a case study of a, a modern radio uh, observatory like the GMRT. So uh, radio astronomy started in India in the early 1960s, uh, not too far uh, uh, after it was, uh, you know, um, first uh, started by Karl Jansky and it was uh, two main groups, uh, one in the TIFR, led by Professor Govind Swaroop, uh, which built the first radio telescopes um, at a place called Kalyan. This, this is the same Kalyan that we know uh, near a uh, suburb of Bombay. Uh, and uh, uh, the other group uh, was primarily anchored in um, Raman Research Institute in Bangalore uh, with facilities at a uh, uh, place near Bangalore called Gauri Bidhanur. And then the TFR group built a large telescope at UTI called the UTI Radio Telescope, which still exists and we still use it. And more recently, uh, about uh, almost 20 uh, years ago, uh, this group uh, started the JMRT project, uh, which has now been operational for uh, several years. And um, uh, this has led to a vibrant growth of radio astronomy in the country and just to understand this a little bit more we'll take a closer look at the typical modern radio telescope uh, we will take the, our own gmrt as an example 
And so it is a major low frequency facility. So if you remember, I showed you this radio window, which is huge. It goes from 30 megahertz to 300 gigahertz that you can actually get radio waves uh, uh, that can be detected on the earth. And uh, no single radio antenna can pick up signals over such a wide range of frequencies. And so often radio telescopes are built to specialize in some part or the other of that wide range of frequencies. So we uh, uh, specialize in the lower part of the frequency spectrum from about 100 megahertz to 14, 15 megahertz. And in this range, uh, this is one of the largest frequent uh, facilities in the world. And it is, as um, you would imagine, an array telescope. Almost all modern telescopes are now uh, arrays, uh, 30 antennas. Each of them is 45 meter in size. Uh, and uh, these were designed, built primarily in-house within the country during the 1990s and operational since 2002 as an international facility used by astronomers from all over the world. And recently in 2018, uh, we completed a major upgrade of the facility, which improved both its sensitivity and also its ability to observe over a more complete uh, range of frequencies in this window of 100 to 14, 50 megahertz. And let's take a slightly closer look. So if you look at the configuration, uh, this is the typical configuration uh, of the antennas uh, with the, uh, this typical Y-shaped structure uh, going out to a radius of almost 15 kilometers. So you are actually synthesizing an antenna of 30 kilometers in size, uh, typical uh, with the typical distances between the antennas. And this is located not too far away from Pune. And in fact, this is the Pune Nasik Highway that is shown here. Uh, and so if you travel there, you actually cross through the array. And uh, these antennas uh, are 12 of them in a central one kilometer by one kilometer compact array. Uh, and the remaining are on small uh, isolated patches of land, uh, which uh, go out to uh, up to a bit beyond 14 uh, kilometers. And so this is um, a Google view. Uh, uh, it shows the central one kilometer by one kilometer region. And you can just about make out the antennas. You can, of course, uh, Google will oblige if you zoom it. And uh, you can now make them out more clearly. And this is the zoomed in view of the three of the closest antennas in the array. The uh, This is the central building where the signals from all the antennas are brought over optical fiber uh, to this location where they are converted back into electrical voltage signals and then further amplified and processed. All that uh, signal processing that I briefly uh, described is all done here in digital electronics. Uh, there's a control room here from where the entire observatory's functioning can be controlled, including configuring the antennas, moving them, setting up the electronics to observe at a given frequency, configuring the receivers, actually looking at the data as it streams through, and then recording the data and making it available for the users. And so these just a few pictures. This is a view of the central square taken from a nearby hill showing the antennas. This is a close up of one of the antennas. And now you can see what 45 meter diameter means. So this is a, a regular truck on which is mounted a very special high lift platform uh, whose height goes up to 32 meters so that it can access the focus uh, of the dish where we place the most sensitive electronics, which first picks up the radio waves, converts them into an electrical voltage, very faint voltage, amplifies it and then sends it down through cables to the bottom from where it is um, modulated onto the optical fiber and sent to the central building. And so as you can imagine, this is a fairly complicated structure. This is how the antennas were built. Uh, they, this is a three-story uh, building equivalent to a three-story tall tower on which the antennas sit. And uh, it was a complicated series of uh, procedures to assemble such an antenna and make it fully functional. And this was when it was uh, opened to the world as a uh, global facility. This is from the dedication ceremony in it was the end of 2001, inaugurated by uh, Ratan Tata, who's uh, chair of the TIFR Council. And um, then since then, it has been used 
by astronomers from all over the world. Uh, this gives you a typical usage pattern of the GMRT where uh, about 50% of the users come from India and the remaining 50% come from all different countries uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, there are, and I'll describe in a minute, the different kinds of experiments. So this is done in an open competitive manner that anybody who has an idea of what they can use the facility for what kind of innovative studies puts in a proposal. The proposals are reviewed, are taken twice a year, six months apart. And then the proposals are reviewed by an expert committee, which then ranks the proposals and decides which ones are the best ones that should be given time on the carrying out the experiment uh, users for a certain amount of time but there's only a limited amount of time available in a six month cycle and that is uh, therefore there is competition because the demand is more than what is available and typically the facilities oversubscribed by a factor of 2.5 which means that only the best proposals uh, then get through and uh, are awarded time for uh, carrying out the observations. And what are the kind of observations? It's a huge range all the way from studying the sun, even studying, uh, searching for extrasolar planets by trying to detect the radio emission, just like uh, Jupiter puts out radio waves. And uh, then various different kinds of objects, pulsars, uh, galactic objects like supernova remnants, uh, microquasars, explosive events like gamma ray bursts and now fast radio bursts and uh, neutral hydrogen in various uh, forms, either ionized or, or neutral hydrogen gas clouds, both in our galaxy as well as in other galaxies. And that's the most powerful way to probe uh, the universe because the neutral hydrogen uh, line emission falls within the radio window. And the radio properties of different kinds of galaxies uh, going out to large distances in the universe, trying to understand the large scale structure of the universe, cosmology, uh, even things like the epoch of ionization in the universe. And uh, last but not the least, uh, broad uniform studies of the universe, uh, sky surveys, much like making an atlas of the sky uh, by uh, studying it uniformly at uh, certain frequencies and and making uh, maps which can be used by different users for various kinds of studies, just like you would use an atlas for as a, a reference document for various kinds of information. And uh, many such um, uh, areas of science that are explored with uh, typically about 50 papers per year published in the international journals, which uh, are based on data from the GMRT. So as you can imagine uh, from just this brief introduction that a facility like the GMRT has many subsystems that make it tick all the way from mechanical, the huge antennas that we talked about. We didn't talk about the mechanism for moving the antennas accurately, such large structures to be positioned and track uh, sources in the sky as the earth rotates. And then the actual electronics from the uh, radio frequency engineering to uh, build these feeds to the amplifiers and all of the other signal processing. And then the optical fiber system to transport the signals and the digital signal processing system to do all the digital processing. And then uh, in order to control and make it work in a coordinated fashion, a, a, a very significant monitor and control hardware, telemetry systems, whereby you can configure everything, monitor everything in real time and run a long observation of many hours uh, from the control room. And then the corresponding software to do all of that. And then finally, the software which is required for actually processing the data once you, uh, to make the images uh, following that very brief description that I gave about how to do the inverse transform of the two-dimensional data that you have in order to make the image and, and so on. So all of this uh, is a whole suite of uh, high technology stuff that is required in order to make all these things work in order to get the kind of science results that I described. And um, I'll just end this part of the description by just talking very briefly about the several uh, of the uh, the fact that over the 15 years, many interesting new science results have been 
produced and that very recently we've completed a major uh, upgrade of the facility to improve its sensitivity by making better quality receivers compared to the technology that is available in the 1990s and also to improve, increase the frequency coverage which makes it uh, uh, one of the most sensitive facilities in the world till we move forward to the next phase. And just to add one um, point of interest, uh, I, we've talked about astrophysics, but such a large sensitive uh, radio telescope can be used for other uh, purposes also. For example, you can uh, use it for uh, as part of space missions for picking up faint radio signals from the uh, uh, man-made probes that go far out into the universe and many of you would have heard about uh, the uh, fact that some of these probes which go out uh, to the furthest planets uh, require very faint, uh, require very sensitive facilities to pick up their signals that come back and there was one experiment in which the JMRT participated which was the ExoMars mission to Mars very similar to the our Chandrayaan 2 where there was lander that is uh, to land after separating from the uh, orbiting spaceship uh, and uh, this signal that the lander puts out uh, was tracked by the JMRT so this is like a 3 watts signal being transmitted from Mars so that's like a mobile phone at Mars being picked up and we were able, actually able to pick this up and track it and uh, just like you saw the track of the real-time track from Chandrayaan 2, uh, this was a similar kind of experiment that uh, uh, was uh, possible to participate, except that it was coming from Mars. And so if there is a bit of time, I'll just take uh, maybe three, four minutes to just uh, talk a little bit about the future, uh, and uh, which is uh, you saw the way radio astronomy has grown, and um, we discussed in detail a typical facility like the JMRT. Uh, it's a major facility built by one country like India and other countries have uh, similar complementary facilities, but these are not, uh, they don't come easy. So today uh, the cost of building a JMRT kind of facility from scratch today would be about 500 crores. Of course, it was much less when it was built at that time. Uh, and uh, if you want to build something much bigger, uh, which is what uh, one really would like as the next generation, uh, it, the cost would be generally very prohibitive for any one country to take it up. And so the way a lot of um, the growth is happening in uh, large facilities in astronomy is international collaborations to come together. Uh, many countries pool together their resources and try to build the next generation facility. And so in radio astronomy, uh, the next generation facility is called the Square Kilometer Array, which is uh, uh, work that's ongoing. The design phase is just finished and the construction will start uh, hopefully by the end of next year. And uh, it will take about six, seven years to build this facility, phase one of it, uh, which uh, will be an, uh, a big step forward because it will be much more sensitive than any of the existing facilities at a range of frequencies, which is much wider than any single facility like uh, say the GMRT or the VLA uh, covers. And uh, so for example, in phase one, there will be 200 antennas spread out over 180 kilometers. Uh, and you can just compare that with 30 uh, antennas of GMRT spread out about a 30 kilometer uh, region. And uh, this will be built in uh, radio quiet parts of the world where man-made radio interference, which is a growing threat for radio astronomy, is a minimal in remote areas in Australia and South Africa. And uh, there's, uh, an, uh, at this moment, there are about 12 to 13 countries that have uh, come together to build this. And India is part of this project and probably more countries may join. So just to give you a very quick idea, there is a um, um, higher frequency part of it made using antennas or dishes similar to GMRT, but more novel and different in design, which will be located in the northern part of South Africa. And uh, this will work at the high range of frequencies of the SKA. And in Western Australia, in the uh, border of the Western Australian desert, uh, will be this kind of an uh, arrangement where the antennas are actually dipoles, not dishes. 
and there is a the farms of typos like this i didn't go into the details of that but these can be made to work in a manner similar to antennas but they have certain advantages compared to antennas and these will be spread out over 80 kilometer region with the 130,000 such dipoles uh, and so the as i mentioned it's a global collaboration with uh, many different countries which are already members and others which are interested in joining and uh, this has been uh, the uh, work ongoing for the last six years and is now reaching the stage where actual building of the antenna uh, of the systems will start and if you got the sense of the kind of technologies that were involved in the gmrt you, you, you can imagine that this would push that envelope uh, to the really the frontline uh, aspects of technology all the way from antennas to low noise electronics to high data rate transmission over optical fibers to supercomputing ability required in order to process the data from such a large number of antennas over a large bandwidth and uh, a very sophisticated management and control software in order to make this vast distributed array of antennas work like a uh, uh, radio observatory and uh, all kinds of uh, new techniques in order to analyze the data uh, because the volumes will be large and the modern techniques will be required uh, in order to uh, make sense of the data and get the best results out of it. So with that, I will stop here uh, with this uh, summary, which tries to summarize the different aspects that I covered here. And uh, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I'm not sure how we are doing that, but uh, um, if there are questions, I, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Yashwan, for the lovely talk, for taking us uh, through the story of radio astronomy from both to modern times and beyond. Uh, there are many questions for you, and we'll be flashing them on the screen. Okay. And uh, yeah, here's one by Kitanjali. Hmm. Okay, that's that's an interesting one. So. Uh, if you talk about the array design, so actually the range of frequencies that can be covered is actually decided not by the design of the array, but by the design of the individual antennas in the array. The array only then allows you to get the higher resolution at any frequency of operation. So, but, so in order to get the, uh, the best range of frequencies, there are two crucial things. One is that every element of the antenna should be able to receive as wide range of frequencies as possible. So that starts from the antenna reflecting surface, the dish itself. Uh, so for example, you may have noticed, I didn't point that out, that the GMRT antenna almost uh, it, it looks like a transparent antenna. You say, where uh, where is the surface which reflects the waves? It's actually a mesh, very fine mesh. Uh, but the mesh will work only for wavelengths which are uh, larger than the mesh size. If you go to wavelengths which are much shorter than the grid size of the mesh, uh, most of the radiation will pass through. So you need a solid surface. So, And then the accuracy of that surface decides what's the highest frequency or smallest wavelength that can reflect accurately from there. So all the way from there, uh, where you have to have the antenna structure such that it can uh, reflect a large range of frequencies to the electronics, the first element at the focus of the antenna, which picks it up and converts it into a voltage that has to respond over a wide range of frequencies. So you have to design it that way. And then the ability to transmit that range of frequencies downwards and be able to process it. So it's a complicated combination of factors, which then, um, you know, you have to take into account uh, while designing the antenna uh, as well as the array in order to get the widest range of coverage of frequencies. And that is one reason why the SKA is split into two parts. The low frequency part is located in one place and the high frequency part is a separate antenna, set of antennas because not no single antenna design can cover that whole frequency range. Okay, that's interesting question. How do the telescopes distinguish between noise and celestial uh, radio waves? Um, that's that's a good question. Uh, so as I mentioned, that one property is that um, the uh, 
you can distinguish that by direction for sure. So for example, if you point to say a blank sky where there's no source, you will see only the noise power uh, coming out uh, the output of the telescope will uh, be uh, all due to the receiver noise or the electronics. When you point that antenna to a source, there will be an increase in that power level, which will tell you that you are now seeing a source. Uh, but you may say, that's, uh, is that the best way? No, there are other ways in which you can actually distinguish uh, the sources. Uh, the other one would be when you make the image, what will happen is that the noise will contribute uniformly to all parts of that image, but the sources will show up in as discrete points or objects. Uh, in the image. Usually, sometimes the noise can also mimic certain such behavior. Then there are again techniques that we have in order to distinguish whether that is a uh, so, uh, noise or a source. For example, if you integrate and observe that same uh, direction of the sky longer, then slowly the source uh, will become stronger compared to the noise and you can then see it uh, more clearly. So, you know, I just gave you a, a quick a uh, snapshot of the different uh, concepts that go behind trying to distinguish between uh, the sources and, and, and noise. Does the number of antenna have a, uh, in an array have any effect on the resolution and the sensitivity? Uh, yes, definitely they do. As you can imagine, the sensitivity is just proportional to the total amount of signal that you collect. So if ideally you would have wanted the antenna to fill that entire 30 kilometer uh, of, uh, of area. But obviously, you can't afford that. And so if you fill that area with more and more smaller antennas, you will get closer to the sensitivity of the 30 kilometer antenna. Resolution uh, also to um, if you fill that area with more antennas, you can get better resolution, uh, though you may say, look, we, we started by saying that the resolution that you will get depends on the furthest separation. That is true. But the, there are finer details of this because each pair of antennas gives you one Fourier component of the image. Uh, in order to do an accurate reconstruction of the image, you would like to have as many Fourier components as possible, uh, which all of which you would have got if you had a fully filled aperture. Uh, and therefore, the more a number of Fourier components you have, even the intermediate ones, uh, which are at shorter separations, uh, you will be uh, you will make a better quality image with the uh, with better clarity of uh, uh, distinguishing the sources. So yes, uh, the uh, both of these uh, do depend on how many antennas you can fill in the array. Okay, next is uh, can't we build radio telescopes in space and then process it and send those to Earth in another wavelength? Well, I mean, uh, you can't build radio telescopes in space. You build them from here and you send them to space, uh, which is what I showed as one example, uh, which was the radio astron example, where uh, the antenna was uh, built here, put on a uh, spaceship and sent out and uh, then uh, literally unfurled uh, the dish uh, and, and then uh, put uh, made a working antenna in space. And the signal collected by that antenna is actually transmitted down to Earth by normal radio uh, uh, links, just like the signal from your uh, that your dish TV receiver receives from the satellite. So it's a similar technology that is used to uh, for the downlink, but what information it is carrying is the radio uh, signal rather than your satellite dish signal. So yes, that is certainly possible and it is done. Okay, now I have two questions flashing. Uh, okay, so the, the one I see on the screen now is, do the radiation from vehicles have any effect? Yes, that's a very good question. And uh, it's the radiation from any man-made activity has an effect. And you may ask, well, what uh, is the radiation from a vehicle. Um, the radiation, uh, predominant electrical radiation from the vehicle comes from the spark plug of a vehicle. So uh, whenever the uh, engine, uh, uh, the, uh, whenever there is a next firing of the spark plug in the engine, it produces a burst of uh, radiation. And so that's firing periodically as the engine is running and you get a, 
you can get a significant amount of uh, such radiation. That's one of the reasons we prefer to use diesel engine vehicles because diesel engines don't have spark plugs. Okay, the next one is uh, why do we have a Y-shaped structure of the GMRT? So this goes back to this question that uh, when I was talking that how many Fourier components of the image can you assemble? And uh, so this is now an optimization problem that if I have n antennas that I can afford to build uh, and I have to spread them out over some region of some uh, diameter, how should I place these n antennas so that I can maximize the number of unique Fourier components of the image that I can measure? And when you work this problem through, uh, you find that the Y-shaped configuration is one of these optimal configurations. Uh, uh, a spiral structure is yet another one. Uh, a, a distribution on the uh, on a circle is another one, but uh, the the two most optimal ones are the Y-shaped structure and a spiral kind of structure. Okay, now this one is, uh, do the diameter of the dish of individual antennas have any effect in the aperture synthesis procedure or is it just the length of the baseline? That's actually a very good question. So this, it's, this goes back to the fact that when you have a single dish, it has a certain resolution. What does that mean? And that is the, given by lambda by d. What that means is that if you point the dish to a given direction of the sky, it will receive radiation over a range of angles, which is lambda by d. Right Now, when you combine the radiation coming over this range of angles from each of these antennas with the, uh, in the array, and you make the image, you, will, uh, you can ask how much of the sky can I uh, image in one uh, go when then all the antennas are looking at a given direction. The area of the sky that you can image is decided by how much area of the sky a single antenna can see, which is lambda by d, the diameter of the antenna. So in that sense, if you have smaller antennas in the array, then uh, the d is smaller, they will see a larger uh, patch of the sky uh, at a given time and therefore the image that you make from those will have a wider coverage uh, while looking in a given direction. The bigger antennas you use, the beam of the antenna is narrower, it sees a narrower patch of the sky and the image that you make will be covering only that much. So that tells you that the ideal would be many small antennas uh, filling up the array which is you know uh, in the limit it becomes the continuous aperture is what you would like to do. But again, you know, if you have large number of antennas, uh, then the cost of uh, processing the signal goes up uh, as n square. Uh, yes, so that question was extend beyond the earth and I, I showed that, no? I showed the example where the baseline was between earth antennas and antennas in the, in space, which were being correlated. Uh, will you generally get NC2 Fourier components through the array? Yes, that, that's correct. So the uh, at any given orientation of the array, I didn't go into a finer detail why it is called earth rotation aperture synthesis. Uh, at a given time, when the combination of antennas is looking in a given direction, you will get NC2 such products. But as time goes by, as the earth rotates and the antennas follow the same source, uh, if you think about it, you will find that actually the effective projected baseline that a given pair of antenna uh, presents to the direction of the source will change slowly from the time the source rises to the time the source sets. And the best way to think about it is to think of a baseline which is east-west. Uh, and uh, when the source is vertically overhead, it sees the full east-west uh, length. If the source is rising or setting, it will see a projected separation of the antennas which will actually go to zero uh, when the source is exactly on the horizon. So we actually use this uh, to our advantage uh, to synthesize different Fourier components from of the same source with the same set of antennas located at the same distances, but just uh, letting the earth rotate and keep following the source at different angles. How can public contribute their little bit to GMRT or any other Indian astronomy research, maybe by donating CPU time or any other way? Okay, that's a good question. And if you talk about, certainly the, one of the best things that uh, people can do is uh, to help in 
um, what is called citizen science. And there are groups in the country which um, uh, try to organize um, the general uh, citizen. And this we are not talking about uh, people who want to take up astronomy as a career, that is, you know, do uh, their studies in, in um, astronomy and, and become and do PhD or, uh, or graduate, or even engineers who come and work uh, in the technology part of it. But the general public, and there are groups which do this, where uh, literally you can use your uh, computers and your CPUs and uh, try to analyze the uh, data that is available from radio observatories. For example, all data taken at the GMRT from the very beginning is all archived and available. And, and you, if you know how to process it, which requires the basic tools to be loaded on your computer, then you can actually do some useful things. Okay, so that's, I think, the ne next question that which tools are used, but that's gone now. It's now um, why doesn't the GMRT do nationwide VLPI? Well, I mean, we don't have an array of antennas which is uh, nationwide. We we do. So, for example, I mentioned that our group has a telescope at UP, and uh, that telescope works at a narrow range of frequencies, around 325 megahertz. And GMRT has that frequency coverage. So we do VLBI between UP and GMRT, for example. We don't have any other antennas in the country which we can do VLBI with. There are plans to set up a nationwide VLBI network, which are just being talked about right now. Hopefully, that may happen over the next few years. Um, this question says, for kinematic studies of a hydrogen cloud, is it always necessary to have a big aperture antenna or can be done with a small aperture antenna? That just depends on the strength of the signal from the cloud. So uh, from with small antennas, people have shown that some of the brightest uh, hydrogen signals from um, some of the biggest clouds in our galaxy can be seen. Uh, and uh, uh, so certainly that can be done. But the moment you want to see more detail, finer structure, or hydrogen clouds in other nearby galaxies, then you need a more sensitive radio telescope. So let's thank uh, Yashwant for an excellent talk and uh, yeah, answering questions patiently. There are more questions which you can read out, reach out to Yashwant on the group and uh, keep posting on. OK, so there's yeah. one on the right now. Uh, it says, if I want to have a career in this field, what shall I do? <laughs> OK, <laughs> all right. So one is uh, you can have a career in this field in two ways. One is uh, the path of doing a degree in physics and then uh, taking up a PhD in astrophysics and there are institutions in the country like ours and others which allow you to do that. Uh, the other way you can contribute in this field is uh, via the engineering path, that if you um, have the right kind of training or background in engineering, and as I showed you, there are various branches of engineering that get applied in radio astronomy, then you can contribute to the growth of the technology that is used in radio astronomy. Both are possible, and we have, uh, at least in our institute, for example, um, uh, people who come from both these different streams who are working and contributing. So let's thank uh, Yashwan for being with us at Astroada. And with this, we come to the end of the session. Thank you for joining. Bye bye. And thank you, everybody, and I hope that that was uh, interesting and useful for people.